Hi there, and welcome to today's presentation. This presentation will cover small scale season extension considerations for annual vegetable production. My name is Brian Sebade and I work for the University of Wyoming Extension. I'm based in Albany County and work out of the Laramie office. When we talk about growing vegetables in Wyoming, obviously we are mostly thinking about temperature. It's cold here in Wyoming and we have a very short growing season. So when we look at temperature, lots of times we will look at a zone hardiness map. While this is great for many of our perennials, it doesn't give us the full picture we need for annual vegetables. Yes, it gives us the minimum temperature, but what we're really concerned about with vegetable production is looking at that time period during the growing season in between periods of frost. This actually gives us a little bit better idea of what we are looking at. So for here, with this map, we are looking at the minimum temperature at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and below. So this is the annual days. So as we can see for certain parts of the state, obviously here on the western side, places in Carbon and Albany County, obviously up around Yellowstone, the Bighorn Mountains, we have a lot of days where we don't have great ideal temperatures for growing vegetables. So this is a really important map to look at for where you might live in the state and the number of days you might be able to expect for growing when you're not experiencing a frost period. This is another important map we can look at, especially when we start talking about warm and cool season vegetables. Here we can take a look at to see how many days we can expect the maximum temperature to be above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. We can obviously see in the southern part of the state and the far western part of the state, we don't experience very many of those days. Uh, it might only be zero to seven days, maybe only two weeks where it's above 90 degrees. This is another great map. Again, uh, this is providing us information related to uh, how many frost-free days we can expect. So as we can see, some of the, the more bright colors, those are going to be the days where we have a lot more frost-free days. So we have a little bit longer growing season that we can expect. Again, the western side of the state, certain parts of the southern portion of the state, we don't have as many frost-free days. This key over here helps us identify how many days that might actually be. So if I look at where I'm at in Laramie, again, we're probably not looking at very many days. This is provided by the Wyoming Climate Office. So as we start planting gardens, we need to think about the time um, we're looking at for ahead. Okay, so, you know, when is that snow going to come? When are we going to be experiencing some frost periods? So we might need to use some planning to think ahead. So this might be for some plants, maybe we don't wanna do direct seeding, and instead we might want to actually transplant some larger plants into that garden space and not take that time to wait for them to germinate and to establish. We also need to think about the days to maturity. Some different varieties of vegetables mature a lot faster than other varieties, so we always want to try and select for quick maturing vegetables when we are looking for plants in our short growing seasons here. This is courtesy of Wyoming Ag Statistics and these are spring freeze tables and this gives us um, our chances of when we might experience a freeze. So um, this is really great information depending on where you might live in the state. When you start thinking about when you can actually start planting things outside, when you can actually start using a season extension structure, all those sorts of things so we can get our timing right to get the most out of our growing season. Again, this is the same thing from the same source. Um, this is the fall freeze table. And again with this, this is what we're looking at for that fall uh, time period when we might experience that first frost. Based on these two maps, we can then figure out what our actual growing season might be. And then if we know our local climate, we might also be able to anticipate if there's potential for a frost during the middle of the summer as well. As we start selecting seeds, it's important to think about the days to maturity, which we've already talked about. Um, you know, some seeds might take a while before they germinate. If we think about carrots, for example, um, you know, sometimes it really takes them almost two weeks before they actually start to germinate. So other plants might only take three or four days in the right conditions, uh, but depending on what uh, type of vegetable you're trying to grow, it might be a little bit longer time frame. 
I also really like talking about different types of plants that we have for vegetables. So we can basically break them up into two categories, cool season crops and warm season crops. As we look at these uh, numbers, we can see that some plants like it cold or cooler and some of them like it hot. So when we talked about that map with the temperatures that are above 90 degrees uh, during the growing season, we can see that for a lot of our warm season crops, um, those areas that receive lots of days above 90 degrees are going to be ideal. Um, so what we're trying to do with our season extension structures is basically um, create an environment where it's more ideal for some of these warm season crops. Um, we can also make a, an environment that's more ideal for some of these cool season crops um, on the beginning end of the growing season and then the end of the growing season in the spring and fall, um, just so we can extend that out and hopefully get more days that we're actually harvesting vegetables. Um, as we talked about selecting different types of vegetables, um, these are all warm season crops we have shown here, but we can also think about what types are going to mature a lot faster. So here we have some cherry type tomatoes. Those are going to mature a lot faster than slicing type tomatoes that take a lot longer. Um, we have summer squash here, which is going to mature a lot faster than some of our winter squash varieties. So we can always be planning ahead to select what crops are going to give us the best chance for our climate. Um, so we're going to show a few different types of structures. Um, there's endless designs that are out there. Um, obviously what's shown here today is not what you should just focus on. There's all sorts of things that are out there. Um, people can you know, come up with their own plans, figure out what's gonna work the best for your growing space. Um, and hopefully this just gives you a starting point for where you think you might go. Um, the structures that we have pictured here, um, the low tunnels that are pictured, um, there's instructions on barnyards and backyards. Um, you can go there, print off the um, article and it'll give you a list of materials and a how-to for actually building it. Um, you know, think about the plastics when you're deciding what you might want to build. Um, is it going to be a plastic that you can move? Is it something that's more rigid? It's going to stay in place. Um, you know, how will it stand up to the environment? There's all those sorts of things to consider. Uh, price is probably one of the major things to think about with that. So um, as building materials, you know, fluctuate in price, uh, a lot of our plastics end up being fairly expensive. Uh, so here's a great example. Somebody has built some sort of season extension um, on a roof. Again, another one, a different design, but they had some space, so they made it work, not in a traditional backyard. Um, when we talk about season extension, lots of times we think about uh, geodomes or high tunnels. These are all great, but sometimes they aren't the best for our smaller backyards, and obviously probably won't fit quite as well on rooftops or different places like that. So while these are great, that's not really what we're focused on today, but those options are available. Um, some of these might have barn doors. Uh, we can also have different types of venting. Um, you know, if we look at a, another design of a high tunnel, we have some other types of venting here, maybe not the fans. Um, so I bring this up just so you have the, the thought of, we probably need to think about cooling some of these structures that we end up building once the temperatures become really warm. Um, so for here where I live in Laramie, lots of times I need to start opening up my structures to let some airflow in once we start getting above 60 degrees um, and they're receiving full sunlight during the middle of the day. Um, so here's a smaller scale. Um, some people call these low tunnels, covered wagons, um, whatever you wanna call it. But basically we have um, a two by six structure on the bottom. Um, we don't have to use that. This is kind of a uh, raised garden bed frame type um, that we have here. You can obviously just put these PVC pieces right into the ground. Um, and then we have some other wood material that helps su supply support to the structure. Um, PVC is great because you can generally just screw it into wood material. Um, you don't always necessarily have to drill a pilot hole, um, but once you put in that screw um, or some sort of lag or attachment, um, it generally stays in place, which is really great. Um, with these, pieces of PVC. Um, most of the time we can just bend them. We don't need to use a heat gun. Um, and then we can just go from there. These are 10 foot pieces that have been bent over. Uh, so it's going to be about, uh, you know, a little over four, four feet tall. 
Um, once we get that done, then we want to actually cover it so we can trap that heat in there. Um, there's different types of plastic that we talked about. This one is a po excuse me, a woven poly fiber um, that is um, used for the, the plastic. Um, you can also buy just regular plastic that you might use um, for landscaping or construction purposes. Uh, but just keep in mind, generally those don't last more than one season. So you generally want to find something that's rated for um, a greenhouse or something like that. And while it's more expensive as an upfront cost, um, you're going to have it for many years after. So once we've got our structures growing, uh, we want to think about um, plants that are going to do the best for the size of the structure we have. So here, you know, we have some beets and some beans, um, some lettuce that's bolted in the back. Um, we can add some string or different things if we want some peas to climb or other things like that. Um, but generally with these lower structures, we want to think about crops that aren't going to get too big. Um, we can also scale this up. So here's um, a structure with um, 15 foot lengths. Um, it's a little bit taller. And so now we can start putting in some of our squash, some of our tomatoes that need a little bit more height. Um, and those types of crops that are going to um, do better in a larger, a larger area. So um, it's always important when we're thinking about selection, we have to think about the number of days to maturity, um, the space that's required, and just how is that plant going to survive in the environment that we provide it. Um, so these you know, structures do great. This is that same spot 20 days later. Um, the structures not only provide extra heat, but they can also block the wind that is going over those plants, drying them out and provide a better environment for them. We can do different types of structures. Obviously, here's someone that has a low tunnel, uh, but then they've also um, done more of an A-frame type uh, structure over a smaller bed. Again, this is probably not going to capture as much heat for the A-frame compared to the low tunnel, uh, but still provides some extra um, heat input. Again, here's a plastic that's not polywoven. Um, works just fine, but just we need to know that it's not going to last as long. Um, some folks will obviously also use row covers. Um, one of the things I like to point out is when we use row covers to make sure that they're properly supported and don't actually fall down onto plants as we can see here where some of these have uh, actually fallen down and the row cover is not providing extra space and extra heat. Uh, so generally we put this row cover inside a structure to add another layer. We can also make hard sided structures. Um, so here is one that's just a grow box. Uh, we've got some beans growing in there, but obviously something again that's not going to be super tall, uh, but we can also use this for taller plants to get them growing at the beginning of the year and then they can grow up and out once the season continues, and then we can harvest those plants later. We obviously wouldn't be able to use this in the fall. The other thing we like to talk about is adding extra layers in inside the low tunnels. We've talked about the row covers, but uh, walls of water are really great. They help uh, store extra energy in that water to keep things warm, so this can buy you even more time for sensitive crops. Um, some folks will plant paint jugs black to help absorb heat and then fill them with water to provide extra water and heat um, throughout the growing season. Um, this is really important, especially during the beginning of the, the growing season to have that available. So there's lots of tricks that we can use to help, you know, help things along. Um, these particular um, beds are actually, um, you know, inside a high tunnel just to add that extra layer. And that's all that we have for today. If you have other questions, feel free to contact me at the information provided at the beginning of the presentation. And thank you for listening.